Hello, everyone. I am Mark Heinlein with the National Tile Contractors Association, and I want to welcome you and thank you for taking time out of your busy day to attend today's webinar. Today's webinar is Cracks Kill, Proper Crack Isolation Methods for Tile Installations. Today's webinar is sponsored and presented by Mercrete. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you will be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions. We will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Also, if your audio on your computer is poor, call the number on the invitation you received to this webinar and listen in on your phone. As a reminder, all of our webinars are available to watch at any time on NTCA's YouTube channel shortly after they are presented. It usually takes a few days, but they'll be up there. This gives you easy access to watch or share all of our current and past programs at your convenience. Now for today's speaker. Brett Moni, CTC CTI, is Mercrete's technical sales manager. He manages the company's extensive technical training programs. Monty's career stretches back to 1988, and he has worked all sides of the tile industry to include ceramic tile and setting materials, manufacturing, installation, sales, and distribution. Since 2007, Brett has provided comprehensive technical support for Mercrete's renowned line of tile setting materials. Welcome, Brett. Thank you, Mark. Well, as you guys can see here, um, and I, I appreciate all the accolades there, Mark. Um, thank you very much. Um, we're going to be going through a, a short presentation regarding cracks kill, uh, proper crack isolation methods for tile installations. Um, I hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, I'm going to downsize a few things here, get them out of my way, but uh, we'll get going here. Mark kind of gave you a little bit of introduction to myself. Um, again, I'm Brett Monty. I'm technical sales manager for Mercrete. I've um, been with Mercury for about 15 years. Um, my experiences, um, second generation tiling professional with 34 years in the industry. I've worked on all sides of the industry, including uh, uh, manufacturing for ceramic tile, manufacturing, of course, for setting materials, um, installation side of the business with my uh, family business, and uh, kind of just like I said, uh, worked a little bit of everywhere. I am a CTI graduate um, as well as a CTC graduate. Um, Contact information is there before. If anybody needs anything or has any further questions for me outside of this, um, you feel free to email me. Um, I can give out my cell phone number at the end if necessary. But uh, let's get rolling. Okay, understanding fundamental concepts of proper crack isolation and waterproofing material use. Um, you know, these objectives are really, um, I want to, I don't want to say basic or or run on that that you know basic platform, but we're really just kind of going over the key properties of crack isolation membranes, how they're used um, and what they're used for. Um, you know, we're going to review appropriate substrates and product categories and review key considerations for each. Um, we'll understand how to incorporate these products into detailed drawings for successful tile installations. Um, we're going to dispel any crack isolation membrane myths um, because there's quite a few out there. Um, and that's something that I've just added to this presentation this year and doing this um, is, is some of these myths that go with it. So hopefully we'll enjoy this. If you guys have questions, as Mark said, please put them in the, you know, type them into the comment area. We'll get to them at the very end of this. All right, crack isolation membranes. I originally came from Southern California. Now I reside in beautiful, warm Chicago land area. And I always ask people this when I'm doing live trainings, which I can't really see now, but uh, so always have them raise their hand if they've been through an earthquake. Um, you know, earthquakes and, and slab cracks or slab movement are similar in the, the aspect that it's all about energy. So I'm gonna read something to you here. Think of the start of a slab crack as an earthquake in your floor, a sudden release of energy causing cracks across your substrate. The effect of this energy being released horizontally and vertically in your substrate will most likely transfer through your tile or stone floor covering, creating a one-of-a-kind look. So as you guys can see here, 
you know, the picture on the, my left is a roadway where an earthquake, of course, or a mudslide or something has, has forced that to crack. Um, and on the right is a concrete slab. You can see a quarter stuck into it. Um, you know, cracks are going to happen. Um, it's one of those things where my father used to say that that's ah, 30 years old. It's not moving anymore. That's completely false. Um, a, a concrete substrate is always moving through expansion, contraction, through settling, um, through different moisture contents and, and the substrate that's below that. Um, so soil erosion, any of those. So, you know, we look at these cracks as what can we do in the tile industry to prevent these types of cracks or the types that we, the types of cracks we're going to talk about from transferring or telegraphing through that tile installation. So last thing on this, when placed properly and in the right application, concrete will last a long time. However, nothing lasts forever and concrete is no exception. It will crack. It's just a matter of when. So with that being said is we want to give that insurance, put that protection down on those floors to allow that movement to happen, but you don't end up with cracks that look like these pictures that are there. You know, the most common cracks that we see in our industry are settling cracks and shrinkage cracks. The effect of the crack in your slab can carry through your tile installation in multiple ways. Two of the most common cracks are through the tile or along the grout joint. I'm sure we've all seen these, whether it be on a commercial job or residential job. You know, I, I find that being that I'm from a family that's in the tile business, we walk with our heads down. Um, you know, I'm always looking at things. I'm always looking at tile installations and we see chipped corners. We see cracks going through these um, tile, the beautiful tile installations. And you'll see this crack that just kind of destroys the look of it. Um, so what we're trying to do as a manufacturer, but also as an installation person, we're trying to prevent and ensure that these cracks do not appear. Um, in our beautiful installation, something that we spend a lot of a lot of time on uh, on doing and making right. So when we're talking about cracks, there are two types of cracks. You're going to hear me use the word in plane quite a bit. I'm sure we've all heard it, but there's two really types of cracks that we're looking at when it comes to that type of movement. And one is going to be an in plane, and that's when those cracks are moving, you know, side to side or away from each other, but they're in plane. One's not going up and down. That out of plane is going to be that up and down where it's moving out of plane. Um, as of right now, there is nothing in the industry that can fix that, that we can put tile over that and not have that crack move and transfer our tile. Um, even if you were to grind that high area or raise the low area, that is still considered an out of plane crack. Um, we've had people that have ground it down, put a membrane over on it. it that crack's already moving at one point in time up and down and it's probably going to do the same thing. So typically what we look at those is an out of plane crack is gonna be more of a structural issue, um, structural integrity with that slab. So what we're gonna be talking about is in plane movement. Um, in plane movement, something that we can prevent from going through our beautiful tile installations. Okay, crack isolation membranes. Isolate and bridge movement and cracks in the substrate. Prevent direct transfer to the tile and tile setting materials. Elongate when and where needed to prevent or reduce force transference. Also known as anti-fracture membranes or crack suppression membranes. So typical uses. We're going to isolating tile from shrinkage cracks and realigning control joints. Another typical use is protecting floor finish surfaces from the effects of potential cracking concrete substrates. Another unit use in there is component used in crack isolation systems or assemblies. Um, I'm going to talk about that on the last bullet point. Performance varies. Um, review performance characteristics and intended uses prior to material selection. Um, really what we're going with that is, you know, there's different types of crack isolation membranes that are out there, whether they be liquid, uncoupling, sheet membranes, some of our mortars have uh, crack isolation characteristics built into it. Um, you know, look at those performance variances between those types of products for the right application of what you're using those products for. Last bullet point, increased warranty when used with the same manufacturing products. Um, you know, 
I'm with Mercrete as we've, we've discussed. We've got one of the, the oldest crack isolation, liquid applied crack isolation membranes that have been out there. And speaking for me, but also the other manufacturers that are out there, when you build a system with these products, you're going to better your warranties. Uh, for example, you're using a crack isolation membrane from one company, the same mortar from one company, the same grout from one company. Um, you're going to increase your warranty years on those versus if you were to use one manufacturer's crack isolation, another manufacturer's mortar, and another manufacturer's grout, because we see that quite often. Okay, so looking at a side view here. Um, elongation of membranes over substrate experiencing in plane. That's that horizontal movement that we talked about. So if you've got a concrete slab here, you're showing our, our faux crack going down the middle of it. We have a membrane there, and then we have our mortar, and then we have our tile and grout. So this just kind of gives you that side view. Those membranes um, on a liquid applied membrane are there to absorb that energy of that earthquake. And I'm doing my little quote fingers here. Uh, so when we have that liquid membrane applied at the proper thickness, that movement, that energy goes up, hits that membrane and disperses out underneath the tile. If it's an uncoupling membrane that's on top of it, you'll have an uncoupling membrane that where there's that fabric underneath and there's kind of air pockets that when that movement happens, it, it either tears the fabric or moves underneath the fabric, um, kind of like the old slip sheet days where it's moving underneath it, not letting it telegraph through. Um, and the same, kind of the same aspect with a sheet type of membrane, a peel and stick membrane. It's going to elongate with it, um, but it will not allow it to tear or, or telegraph through um, up to the tile. Okay, this is an actual paragraph that I took out of the NTC and a reference manual. And uh, it, it's such a, it's a great paragraph because there's something in here that we're going to talk about in a moment. But crack isolation systems for ceramic tile and stone installations are intended to accommodate anticipated movement. And I'm kind of highlighting that anticipated movement and related stress that a substrate exerts on the installation without adversely affecting the performance or appearance of the finished installation. I kind of highlighted in my, my, my words there, anticipated movement. Um, we get a lot of questions as a manufacturer that can I just chase a crack? Well, NTCNA or TCNA methods, F125 partial, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, allows you to chase cracks. As a manufacturer that manufactures these types of products, we wanna see the entire installation everywhere there's going to be tile have a crack isolation membrane, membrane because we're anticipating movement. We're anticipating that. I had said earlier, my dad had always said, that's ah, 30 years old, it's not moving anymore. Again, false. We're going to anticipate movement. So take that extra time, extra, put it into your bids, talk to the homeowners about the cause and effect of not having a crack isolation membrane there to be able to protect that floor. It's that insurance that that beautiful installation is going to last for years, looking the same way it did when you installed it. Okay, are they required? Are crack isolation membranes necessary? What's the risk versus the cost? Is it worth not using? Um, again, I just spoke about that. Um, you've got installations here. We've got a, a sawtio paver. Looks like we've got a travertine, and that looks like an epoxy flooring over on the right-hand side is, you know, do we want to see these on those jobs? Do you want to get that call back from a homeowner, um, you know, whether it be six months or six years down the road saying my floor has a crack running down the middle of it? Um, you know, it's it's one of those things. Are they required? They're not required. Are they necessary? In my world, I believe they are necessary, and I hope everybody else's as well. Um, again, it's that insurance to be able to protect that floor. Again, are they required, necessary, or worth the risk? Um, Wynn Hotel, I don't know if anybody's been to that, but there's a beautiful mosaic that they've got there um, out in the lobby area, the Venetian Hotel natural stone. Um, we know for a fact these have crack, crack isolation membranes under these installations. If they did not, could you imagine having to replace those? What the the cost of that would be, uh, but also by replacing those or going down 
and fixing that area where we have a crack, you could be looking at possible shades not matching, um, of course, grout not matching, um, all kinds of variables in there that it, it will never look the same from when it was initially installed. So uh, are they necessary? No. Are they required? No. Should they be used? And that's an absolutely yes. Substrate realities. Uh, I'm sure all the installers that are on this call can tell you that slabs are never perfect. Um, that's why we manufacturers do so well with our surface prep products. Um, we all know that surface prep is the one of the key components to your installation. It's it's the, the old adage of saying is your installation is only as good as a substrate that it sits, sits upon. So we want to do everything that we can to achieve that substrate. We may get that floor flat to uh, meet our TCNA requirements. But the question is, is just because it's flat, is it still protected from cracks? No, it's not. And that's where crack isolation membranes come in. Slab on grades, we're dealing with moisture issues, hydrostatic pressure, efflorescence, um, the types of concretes. Are they post-tension? Are they conventional? I come from the West Coast where a lot of the uh, installations were post-tension slabs. When you move across the country, they're not necessarily post-tension, they're more conventional. And one of the other issues that we're dealing with, especially on the commercial side of the business, is curing compounds. Um, you know, these are all things that we're looking at. Curing compounds are bond breakers. Um, so these are things that we need to look at when we're looking at slab on grade. Um, above grade floors, we're looking at deflection. Uh, post-tension slabs for those engineered floors, hydration, cracking, curing compounds again, um, gypsum substrates. Um, I just learned how to say this word the other day. I never heard it before. Um, ringite. Um, you know, that's the the kind of the silica or the crystals that that get dispersed on the top of a gypcrete or gypsum-based floor. Um, all of these are areas or, or substrates, whether it be wood or slab on grade where a crack isolation membrane can be used, not only for a crack isolation membrane, but also for a bondable surface. Um, so again, these are things that we look at with the substrates. Okay, types of crack isolation membranes. We've got liquid applied membranes. We've got sheet goods, peel and sticks. Um, there's other ones that are gonna be sheet goods that are, are, are mortared down. Um, you got uncoupling systems. Uh, Others, you have tile adhesives where you've got mortars that have that crack isolation properties built into it. Um, and again, another slip sheets, we've had cork, paper, vinyl, et cetera. We just need to make sure that whatever slip sheet or crack isolation membrane we're moving to or using is approved by TCNA or industry. And, and as well as what's required by um, a lot of times the, the counties and states. Benefits of a liquid applied. Seamless. Um, I always use the word monolithic, um, but they're seamless. They're, they're one sheet once it's dry, if you look at it that way. They're easy to use, applicator friendly, conforms to irregular shapes and covers hard to reach areas. So if you've got radius areas, there's no cutting involved. There's, they're literally, you pour it out and you're rolling it on almost like a squeegee with a paint roller. Um, you have less waste because you're really not cutting pieces and having small pieces left over. Um, they are used for preventative, um, doing that entire floor. You're preventing cracks from transferring or telegraphing through. Reduce labor and labor costs. They're super fast to put down and install. Um, reduced installation time, uh, meaning again, that goes back to that, they're fast, they're easy to use. Um, we can do hundreds of square feet fairly quickly. Um, we've got products and other manufacturers have products now that dry fast um, and you're on them within an hour or two. So um, benefits of a liquid applied are, are, are great. Um, as you can see, there's quite a, quite a few of them there. Um, applications, proper per surface prep per TCNA guidelines. Um, we're not gonna get too much into surface prep of it, but we just wanna make sure that the substrate that we're going over meets and exceeds TCNA guidelines for what it needs to be. Um, primer as required, um, membrane applied as manufacturers recommended thickness. Um, you know, I've got a wet mill gauge that I'm always carrying around with me. Um, I can speak for Fracture Guard, but nobody else's product. We require it 30 mils wet, um, which is about the thickness of a credit card. Um, once it's dry, cured and dry, 
couple hours for the fracture guard FD, you're installing tile right over the top of it. So as you can see, it's an easy application. Okay, benefits of a sheet membrane peel and stick type products. Um, full coverage, full area coverage, wherever they're at. Isolated cracks, partial coverage, meaning that if you're running that or chasing that crack, running that crack, you can use these products for that. Um, they tend to be a little bit thicker than a liquid applied membrane. Um, you know, one thing to always remember, which we're going to talk about with uh, um, TCNA method F125 partial, is it's a 12 inch minimum width or the width of three tiles. Um, as we know nowadays, just to give you an example with a 12 inch tile, if you're chasing a crack, that's one and a half times the size of the tile on each side of the crack, which is 18 inches. So you're talking a total of 36 inches to chase a crack. My opinion is do the entire floor. Uh, primer is often required with these products. Here's the biggest advantage to them. Most peel and stick products allow for three eighths to quarter inch crack treatment or uh, in plane movement. So that they can really withstand the, the stress and the energy put out by larger cracks. There are thicker peel and stick membranes that can give sound dampening properties. Um, again, there, there's the peel and stick membrane, the liquid applied membranes that, uh, that do very well out there in what we're asking them to do. Okay, application of these, prop, again, proper surface prep per TCNA guidelines, you're going to see kind of a, uh, uh, a trend here on each one of these when we talk about them. Again, primer is required. You're going to position the membrane centered over a crack. You're going to peel it and stick it, hence that's right in the name of the product. Um, I don't know if a lot of guys have used these out there. They're really quick. They're really easy. Um, and once they are down, once they've been rolled and they've got the bubbles and any bridges or anything that's been up, caught up underneath it, um, they're ready to for install. So they're quick and easy, and there's really no downtime in waiting for these to dry. Okay, benefits of an uncoupling system. Stress relief between the substrate and the finish of material. Again, it's working as a crack isolation. It's, it's relieving that stress. Layered assembly utilizing a textured sheet to create a shear differential interface or interference layer. So again, like we talked about earlier, when you have that in-plane movement, that energy comes up or that crack moves and it's going to kind of shear that, that fabric that's underneath it, which it's what it's supposed to do. It's in the name of the product, uncoupling. So it's it's shearing from there, but not allowing that, that energy or that crack to transfer through that installation. It allows independent movement of the substrate and the tile. Air pockets for in-plane movement, air pockets allow for in-plane movement and eliminate stress differentials between the substrate and the tile and stone materials. So again, those air pockets, the way these products are manufactured and designed, whether they be circles or squares or triangles or, or irregular shapes, they're all serving that same purpose um, of working as a crack isolation membrane to keep it from going or transferring or telegraphing through that tile. Typical applications. Again, here's that trend, proper surface prep part per TCNA guidelines, primer as required. You're gonna position the membrane, you're gonna cut it to size, the area that you need to do. You're gonna apply adhesive and lay and coupling membrane. You're gonna apply it, typically it's used with a mortar. Um, that mortar is gonna be mixed up typically to a little bit um, wetter than what you would normally to install the tile. You're gonna use a weighted roller. You're gonna get out any of the air pockets or bubbles that might be underneath it. Once it's down, you're ready to install tile. Some uncoupling manufacturers require that the mortar be cured and dried underneath before installing, and some allow you to go directly on top of it right after the membrane's put down. Okay, so I talked earlier about the methods, the TCNA methods. Here's a couple of excerpts, excerpts um, from the TCNA guidelines or TCNA handbook. You've got F125 partial coverage, and you've got F125A full coverage. Um, again, we're always going to go towards that full coverage because we never know where a crack is going to appear. You may chase a crack that's existing when you're doing your installation, but who's to know that six months, six years down the road, you end up having another crack, another area of that floor. Imagine looking at that 
picture of those hotels, the Wynn Hotel with that giant mosaic running through it, is if we've had a crack appear in that, and we've got to fix that area and replace the tile. So we've got to treat that crack. We go in, we remove the tile and just understand that we're not removing that tile just where the crack is. We're removing whatever size that tile is to accommodate the area and the requirements for partial coverage, which is one and a half times the size of the tile being installed. So again, we just go back to a standard 12 by 12 tile. That's 18 inches each side of that crack, so you're ripping out 36 inches of tile in some small areas, that might just be the entire room. So the cost to fix an area or to fix an area that has a crack could far outweigh what the cost was for the original installation. Um, and it will probably never look the same unless the homeowner or yourself kept the same dial lots of the tile being installed. So again, we're always moving towards recommending that full coverage putting that insurance on that entire floor. So again, these are the two here. You're gonna see these, we see these a lot in our uh, architectural specs um, on installations, but again, whether they be architectural specs um, for a commercial job or it, just a simple residential job, and I don't mean simple as insulting to anybody, but you know, a residential job is a crack isolation membrane should be installed under every single tile installation going over a concrete substrate. Here's the, this is the Mercury version of our F, um, F125 full. It basically just shows the products. It shows our products sub substituted into it, but this is one of the methods um, for the F125 full coverage. Um, again, just, just showing there that you have a bond crack isolation membrane in this assembly. And then here's the partial where it's showing just a partial coverage into it. Okay. These are going into, we're kind of moving into those myths now. Um, we're not too far from being done here. Um, true or false, crack isolation membranes alleviate the need for movement joints. Um, this is something I had said earlier that I kind of added into our presentations. Um, so this is really the first time I'm presenting this to an, an audience is one thing that we've been finding out being on the technical side of the business is that we have a lot of installations that are happening across the United States, especially over concrete substrates, where the feeling in some cases, not all, some cases, that just because I have a, because I have a crack isolation membrane, I now don't need to worry about um, saw cuts, expansion joints, perimeter soft joints. Um, is this true or false? Well, I'll answer that for you. That's false. I'm going to turn this up real quick here. I'm going to hit pause and then turn it back up. I want you guys to see this floor here. I stole this from the interweb and I'm going to turn it up. Hopefully everybody can hear the amount of energy that's being released on this floor. My oh, gosh. No way, that is, that is incredible. Hey, my goodness. It's actually pulled up all the dollars. Yeah. You know what you know, you know, It's because it's shut. Shit, the whole house is shut. And there's no space for the tiles. They've all popped up. They've never left enough spacing when they put the tiles down. They could have Yeah, the tiles are too close together. Look at this popping up in front of our house. Okay, okay, it's gonna go. Okay. You know? Now listen, if I don't know what it's been. <laughs> you wouldn't have left the jet, no. I run outside. My lord, I mean, what I do, I can't even walk on it, man. Yeah, you just push it down. No, they'll crack. Yeah. Look at that, look how it's pulled up there. Just... Mm. We'll have to lift mm. the tiles. All right. So I hope you guys could hear that. Um, 
the, the amount of energy that's being released under these tiles. Now, I don't know if you guys could hear um, the gentleman talking. He was saying that, A, he thinks the house shrunk, uh, which kind of goes with that expansion contraction um, or thermal expansion contraction. And then he's also saying that the grout joints were too small, not allowing movement. Um, there's more to it than that. It's perimeter soft joints is what we're talking about um, on a lot of these. And, you know, EJ171, sure, yeah, didn't skip a slide there. Um, EJ171, all the categories with inside that, um, those are still absolutely necessary to be used in installations, whether you have a crack isolation membrane or not. Um, I've got a lot of jobs, you'll see a couple of pictures in a few minutes where I've looked at, um, and they come back to us as a manufacturer saying our products failed, but really it's not the products, it's the installation that failed. Um, it's the, the fact that there was no perimeter joints in these, but yet they had a crack isolation membrane. And the response was, well, isn't that supposed to absorb the energy? Well, it is supposed to absorb the energy from a crack, but not full shear movement. Um, so just because you have a crack isolation membrane does not remove the need to follow EJ171 movement joint guidelines. Um, and I'll tell you, especially on a residential, that perimeter soft joint is so important um, to have that in your jobs and, and to be able to rely on that, to absorb that energy so we don't end up with a video where somebody's thinking their house is shrinking. So dispelling myths. But before I read that, these pictures here on the right-hand side are a couple of jobs that I've actually looked at. Um, two of them are the same job. One of them's a different job. Um, does look the same. But uh, you can see that middle picture, that's a three-quarter inch rise that that tile had nowhere to go. And when you have a crack isolation membrane there, that is, by all terms, the weakest point in that installation. And it's not supposed to handle that large or, or any type of shear load movement um, on that. And what ends up happening is that membrane will crack or sh shear right in the middle. You'll end up with a piece of tile coming up with mortar and membrane stuck to it. And then you'll still have membrane down on the floor and it just shears. It's not designed to handle that amount of shear pressure or shear movement. So again, perimeter joints or any joints um, for large areas, um, saw cuts, expansion joints um, are supposed to be honored through the installation. So dispelling membrane myths. Crack isolation membranes do not allow you to eliminate expansion joints. Must always use soft joints within the tile work to allow for expansion and contraction. Refer to the Tile Council of North America Handbook Method F125 for guidelines and details. Most membranes are limited to eighth inch cracks, but we did talk about the, the peel and stick. That one could go up to three eighths, quarter inch uh, movement. So some membranes, uncoupling mats or peel and sticks can handle larger cracks. Um, crack, isolation crack isolation membranes do not warrant against out of plane or vertical movement. That's that up and down. Proper placement of expansion joints is determined by numerous items. Exposure to sunlight, thermal cycling conditions, moisture conditions, aging of the concrete when applicable, structural movement and expected loading and numerous other design criteria. So again, refer always to the methods in the TCNA handbook for EJ171. Industry best practices and manufacturer's recommendations should be consulted and followed. As we all say as manufacturers, if you have questions, call us. That's what we're here for. That's what people are there in my position for. We all have people like myself um, and all the different manufacturers. If you have questions uh, or you need guidance, um, that's use the manufacturers for that. Let the manufacturers tell you how to best do that installation. And a big thank you. Now, I guess we're gonna go through some questions if you all have any. Hi, Brett. That was a terrific presentation. A lot of uh, information and detail there um, uh, about these membranes. And it is such a critical application to, to be aware of the cracks and uh, aware of the need to put our expansion joints or movement joints um, and to apply our membranes at the right thickness and where we need them. Terrific information, Brett. Thank you. Thank you. 
I do have some questions for you. Um, you know, let's start off here. You mentioned that with your wet membrane, your wet liquid film membrane, that you measure that with a, a gauge and you require a 30 mil thickness. I think that's what you said. I've got a couple of questions from that. Uh, first of all, what is a mill? And if you know, and uh, how do you, how exactly do you measure 30 mils? Well, I don't know if you guys can see. Can you see me, Mark? Yeah, I can see you, Brett. Cool, because you see me holding up this right here? This is our wet mill gauge. And on this, there's numbers all the way from one all the way up to 80 mils. Um, a mill is basically um, a, 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 was it a millimeter? Is that right? Um, I believe it's, was it one thousandth of an inch? One one thousandth. One one thousandth of an inch. Um, and it's so it's mills in here. So we've got these wet film gauges. You can pick these up through most of your manufacturers out there. Um, maybe even paint shops, um, uh, paint places like uh, uh, Benjamin Moore. Um, they'll have wet mill gauges that they just hand out. They're little plastic ones. And they'll have little teeth on them. And basically, you're using these. You're going to take this. You're going to find the 30 mil mark, which for me, it's right there on this one. And we're going to take this as the membrane's met, wet. We're going to push it down into that membrane. Some people like to drag it a little bit backwards um, and they can still see the front side where it says 30 mil and see if we're hitting that 30 mil tooth. Um, and the reason the thicknesses are so important on liquid applied is A, they are water-based products. So they're a water, they might, some might be acrylic based or asphalt based, but they're all gonna have water in them. And so when they dry, they're going to shrink a little bit. So that 30 mils, once it's cured out and dry, it might drop down to about 22 mils, which is acceptable by, for our products, which is acceptable thickness. Um, but having that thickness in the liquid applied membranes is so important because we had talked about that energy. Um, I used to have an old boss that used to always say, imagine a piece of jello. When you put your, you know, let's say we put our hands together and we put that jello on top of it and we move our hands, that jello is absorbing that energy. Okay, and that's kind of the same concept of what a liquid applied crack isolation membrane is doing. That's an interesting analogy with the jello, but that, yeah, that makes sense. I can visualize that. Um, okay, great explanation. Thanks. So, you know, I, that brings up a question in my mind is it more better? So, if you need to get 30 down, shouldn't we just put a lot more and won't it be better? Um, you know, you would think we would love to say more is better um because you know hey we're going to end up selling more but that's not always the case when you start putting down um globs of a liquid membrane whether it be waterproofing or crack isolation membrane they're made to perform their optimal best at a thickness that we're determining so when we say 30 mils um that is when it's going to perform its best now if i went on it thicker with that product I'm gonna end up with it possibly skimming over in areas and it may not dry underneath, almost like a blister. Um, for when we go to trowel our mortars or key in our mortar into it, we may pop that blister and then it just smears into our mortar and really at that point in that area, that membrane's ineffective. Uh, gotcha, well, that makes a lot of sense. More isn't always better. Exactly. What, where do we find, that if, if we can't remember that 30 mils or we need to know, for what product, what the thickness should be, where do we find that information? You're always gonna find it from your manufacturer's data sheets. I, I, I can tell you ours have them um, on there for requirements for the installation um, of liquid applied. You're gonna have other manufacturers that they're gonna tell you on the websites as well. Okay, uh, here's a question. How, you showed, uh, in addition to the uh, liquid membrane material, you showed some peel and stick or some sheet or some uncoupling type material. How do you know which one to select or which one to specify? Is there a way that you can uh, make a determination which one to use, when and where? Well, it's, it's gonna come down to, Mark, if it's a commercial job and they are going through architectural specifications, typically the architectural specifications always going to, is already going to have either the ANSI um, number for what they want um, or, or what they want in that, if not by product name, by ANSI number. Um, if it's a residential job, you know what? I always say that if you're, you're, 
doing your preliminary look on the job and you're starting to see some fairly large in-plane cracks that are there, then you're going to want to look for, excuse my technical terminology here, but a beefier product, um, something that can handle those those larger cracks. So it's, you know, we always do our preliminary, preliminary walks on our jobs to where we're looking at that floor to see what conditions it's in before we start even doing our surface prep. So um, I will say this, and in, in saying surface prep, crack isolation membranes, you always want to achieve, and you notice when we were talking about the application of these products, that your floor meet the TCNA guidelines for surface prep, and that's your flatness, um, where you need to be, all of your tolerances. Your crack isolation membrane should always be as close to the tile as you can get it. So it's really going to be the last thing you're doing prior to your mortar and your tile. So if you have to do any um, substrate prep for flatness, do that before the membrane goes on. Absolutely, yeah. You're going to do your self-leveling or any patching, any bird bass or undulations in the floor prior to your crack isolation membrane. Great, great advice, great information. Um, you mentioned uh, ANSI specifications for membranes, uh, and those I know are found in ANSI A118. How yes. do we find what um, ANSI specification a membrane might meet or exceed? Where is that information found? Um, it will be on the technical data sheets for those products. Um, so from the, the, the websites from the manufacturers, you can get the technical data sheets. Um, TDS forms is the short term for it, and they are, all, I, I will say all of them will have your ANSI specifications, what that product meets for ANSI specifications. They might say ANSI 118.10 um, for waterproofing um, or 12, and it will go up uh, or say meets and exceeds these. Okay, some, great. Mm -hmm. some, and again, I had mentioned earlier, some you know counties require different things in different states um, for what they're doing. So also check with local authorities, they might have requirements. More so on commercial jobs, yes. Okay, here's another installation question. Um, you know, we, we've checked it, after we've applied it, you check it with a wet film gauge. Does the substrate, like the concrete, you, you mentioned it needs to have a certain surface profile and you need to check into that, may require a primer. Um, does it also, need to be cleaned are you concerned with bond breakers or any dirt or anything is that important absolutely um you know a, a clean substrate is everything um and i know coming from both sides of the commercial and residential installation i always say this is when you walk in and look at a floor um, whether it be a remodel new construction new commercial construction or remodel commercial construction everything they've used to build that job is on that floor and whether it be paint spray, um, over sprays from other types of painting um, or doing cabinets, um, you've got people, you got all the, the, the lumber guys, framers writing on them, writing on the floor. All of that can accumulate to be a bond breaker. So we do need these floors to be clean and acceptable um, for those. And as we always you know, talk about is, you know, you bless it, you put a little bit of water on it, you see if it soaks into it. We wanna make sure those pores are open and clean so that way when we put these products on, especially a liquid applied or even the mortar applied, we're using those pores to be able to get that bond, to be able to have our bonded membrane. And so the fact of having to bond to that substrate, we don't want anything in there to break that bond. Right. Yeah, these are not like a cleavage membrane. These are not membranes that are sitting on top of it. They're not free floating. Um, peel and stick, uncoupling membranes, as well as the liquid appliance. These are all bonded crack isolation membranes. Yeah, like that one photo you showed us, that membrane had actually sheared within the yes. membrane. It was bonded to the substrate and bonded to the tile. Correct. So it was well bonded and it, it did its job. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and a lot of these membranes, you know, especially liquid applied, um, and well, actually all of them, they can go over wood as well. And so even over a wood application, they're bonded to those wood substrates. Okay, interesting. Can go over wood as well. Uh, here's a question. Um, and, you know, we have a, a Brett, I got to tell you, we've got a terrific group of attendees uh, on this 
program. Today. So thank you everybody for being here. And uh, one of the questions we have is, and, and, you know, and we've been talking about this, the standards and you mentioned the testing. Do you have any videos of the actual testing process that reveals the effectiveness of the different membrane types? Do you know of, are there videos out there for people who are trying to understand what happens in the laboratory to test these products and materials? I don't, but that is actually a great question. Um, you know, we're in the process on the Mercury side of the business of updating our website and, and putting a lot of new content out there. Uh, but I guarantee you I could reach out to Bill or any of the guys at uh, TCNA and for their lab and see if they have any videos of showing testing. Because each one of those membranes that we spoke about, um, they're, the, the science behind those are all different. Um, you know, like I said, the liquid applied membranes kind of absorbing that en energy and dispersing it out. That's why we need that proper thickness. Um, a peel and stick's gonna be kind of the same thing because it's a um, the asphalty base that's underneath that peel and stick kind of absorbs that energy, but it has a fabric on top of it that's not gonna allow it to rip or tear through. Uncoupling mats are gonna allow it to, to move back and forth underneath the installation without subjecting the installation um, or the tile installation to cracks. So uh, but no, that's definitely a great idea, but right now I, I can't think of anything that's out there. Mark, you might know better than I at this point. Um, there might be uh, from the TCNA lab some videos available. I'm, I'm not either uh, sure about that, Brett. Uh, that yeah. is a terrific question. Um, I have had the privilege, I know, to have some manufacturers' laboratories and seen some testing, and it's impressive. Yeah, we've um, we've got testing in our labs. We've got two labs um, within the United States, two R and D um, and quality control labs, well, QC labs. We've got everywhere, but uh, two main R and D labs in the United States that we use. Um, that are under our in our plants and I can definitely check with those guys but I, I TCNAs you know if anybody has I've never had the chance to go to the the, the facilities the, for TCNA it's it's a great little tour to go over there and, and really see the science that they put into to make our industry and products better you know Brett you mentioned sharing uh, your email address would you mind sharing that and, and I can type it here into the question screen yeah. and maybe our question and uh, uh, send you an email, and, and if you come across the video, you could send it to them. So yeah, there, yeah, there it is. All right. Yeah, feel I'm, free. I'm typing that in the, the question screen here as well. All right, excellent. Thank you, Brad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, I was really glad you did, is the NTCA reference manual. Yes. Uh, we, we talk about the ANSI standards, we talk about the TCNA handbook and the methods and standards recognized by the tile industry. Um, and all of our, our NTCA training programs, we base our training on those methods and standards and manufacturer's instructions, everything you've been talking about today. Yeah, and there's the reference manual right there. And what a critical document that is a companion volume to all of all of the things we've been talking about. There is so much in there um, and written by a group of industry experts. Uh, so I, I know that you recommend it, your, your company recommends it. I've got mine right here as well. So if anybody out there on this broadcast doesn't yet have this book, make sure to get your copy available. I, I, I'm gonna add to that and say, Mark, where not only the TCNA handbook, but the reference manual, even if you, you, you don't think you're a big enough installer to require the need of one of those, um, you're wrong because you're all you know important when you're out doing uh, representing our industry. Um, but really where that those come in to become a great help for you is when you go into a job and you're in trying to explain something to either a homeowner, a general contractor, or whomever it is, if you have something that you can reference back to that is industry specific, specific that's supported by the industry, uh, to be able to show them, it's it's really a great backing for yourself to be able to say, look, this is why I need to do this for your installation. Yeah, Brett, we were talking about that before the program began, and I have this conversation with many people all the time at our training programs is, our ability to understand, own, 
actually own and actually use and apply the industry uh, standards and methods and best practices in our uh, installations and specifications is so critical. And it gives us the confidence to be a better professional. And if we can become more confident and what you just said, the ability to communicate that to the people you're working with is tremendous. And to communicate that um, uh, with the architect or specifier or the general contractor, for instance, that just creates an atmosphere of respect for the tile industry and the tile installer and the tile contractor. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, really they are our uh, you know guidance, um, are the tools that we have to guide us um, for you know that proper installation or those proper methods. Um, and again, they're a great way to back yourself as an installer, a reputable installer out there, being able to back yourself up and say, look, this is why I have to do it. I'm just not trying to get an extra 10 grand out of you. This is why I need to do it. That's right, necessary stuff all around. Labor and materials, time and materials and need to get paid for it. I have one last uh, uh, technical type of uh, comment, I guess, more of a comment than a question, Brett. Um, and this is a comment towards uh, uh, partial crack isolation that you talked about, and you showed us in the method. and a couple of things there another benefit of membraning the entire uh, substrate or the entire floor would be and you mentioned this too is a flat substrate when you do a partial you might get a little bit of an unflat substrate there that gets a little bit difficult to to trowel over um so that would be another benefit is getting that flat substrate with full yep. coverage and then in that those details, you need to get your soft joints in the tile layer as well. And the minimum of three tiles spanned underneath yeah, that or above. Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh like I said, we I'd shown those pictures before um on it. And I don't know if y'all can still see my screen here, but uh, you know, these pictures here, these jobs, they had, you know, they tried to do some soft joints. They did some soft joints in kind of the main areas, but they forgot around the island in the kitchen and at the door jams, at their slider. Um, and, and there was a lot of doors access here. And so, you know, they really tried to accommodate soft joints, but not everywhere. And as you can see what happened on those installations with those pictures. Um, so it really is important that regardless if you have a crack isolation membrane or not, that you're you're paying attention to what is being done um, in those uh, for your EJ171, paying attention to that. Pay attention, and if you're the installer, that, that piece of tile ends up in your hands, you're the last person in a long line of quality control to make sure that the job is being done right. So think about what you're doing before that tile goes down and uh, stop ask questions and get them answered before you continue yep. i think it's uh best practice to do that absolutely there's the detail right there yeah yeah i made a large okay, I, yeah thank you brett i think that's all the questions we have from our attendees uh, that's all of the questions that i had here brett um okay. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, I think I talked enough. But again, you've got my 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 email information's out there. Um, you know, those of you that uh, have any further questions or or, or or help with anything, please feel free to contact me. That's what I'm here for. Brett, I want to thank you, Brett Monty, uh, and I want to thank Mercrete for sponsoring and presenting today's NTCA webinar. And I want to thank our uh, fabulous group of attendees that were with us today. We certainly appreciate it. And please tune in to all of the webinars that are coming up. Watch for our 2022 schedule of webinars that will be coming out very soon. And make sure you go to NTCA's YouTube page where this webinar will be recorded and posted uh, within a few days. So check back, uh, tune back in, join us again, and uh, be safe out there and we'll see you in next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Great, great job.